I feel very nervous <laughs> as all you smart people looking at me and expecting smart things to be said. <laughs> so, um, so I'll just state that it's, it's a nerve-wracking position, and I'm not even thinking about being filmed. Um, so I'm uh, John Strasnick is uh, Dr. Straz, um, and I am tasked with talking about your brain and drugs. And it's kind of a misnomer in that it's, I think really, it's about your relationship with addiction and with your uh, patients who have addictive disorders. Um, I think that in some ways this, we're a terrible match for our patients because we are coming at them with a lot of cortex and they do not have a cortical illness. Um, they have a relational limbic Ill illness. So how to bridge that, I think, is part of the, my challenge today. So what you're getting here is the result of 20-some uh, years of working with folks with addiction listening to what they found I said was helpful or useful and, and also not hearing anything about what they've told me wasn't helpful. Um, so, and again, I encourage you in your training to, to do two things. One is learn all this cortical information you're gonna get, but also just also be working on how do you really just relate to folks who have a uh, a substance use disorder, okay? So I'm gonna give you a little talk about that, that I, this is based on a talk I give patients um, in the auditorium series, and I, I, I get lots of positive feedback from it, so it makes me think I should be doing it um, as far as just helping them relate to their illness. And again, it's, it's again the idea back to what Mike was already talking about, about trying to, to you know, have a uh, medical model or a doctor talking to them about their illness. It gives them some sense of um, importance for their illness, um, but it also, um, uh, the way we talk about it helps them not take it as personally uh, because so much of the pain of addiction is the personalization of it. And just, you know, I must be a bad person because of what I have done. <laughs> so what you'll hear in this uh, amalgamation of a talk that I give to them is just ways for them to understand how they can uh, realize that the, the reasons they've acted the way they have is partly because of their brain being hijacked and I use the word hijacked by drugs and alcohol, okay? And it's also to change their relationship to their illness because the goal in my experience is not to make people hate their illness, hate their addiction, fear their addiction. It's to get them interested in their addiction and to get them relating and caring about their addiction. So we'll see if I'm successful in communicating that to you as well. Uh, Stress, I yeah. just uh, yeah. Mike mentioned, or maybe somebody made a yeah. comment that um, information about the brain yeah. disease model of addiction, I think somebody said that it actually might increase stigma or there was that question. Yeah. But uh, I saw find it, I saw recently that um, was some data on teaching patients, individuals with substance use disorders yeah. about brain science, neuroscience yeah. and addiction. Yeah. Actually has been associated at least in this one study with yeah. treatment gains. So yeah. yeah. So and again that's um, certainly in, in that and then my own experience that, you know, patients will stop me in the parking lot where all your best interactions are gonna happen here <laughs> and and say, Oh, you know, you're the brain doctor, you know, and oh, you know, I, I thought about that talk when I was dealing with this or that and boy that, you know, helped me. So that, you know, is why I think it's worth repeating. Um,
but yeah, I, I, I do feel like trying to depersonalize it is the key, you know, because so much of this illness is very personal and it is a, I think it's more than a brain disorder, it's a relationship disorder. It's a relationship disorder with themselves and it's a relationship disorder with the others. So, and then you'll see how I tag that into some neurobiology. Very, very um, simple. Uh, so, some of this is also uh, based on George Valiant, who's a very famous researcher who's looked at addiction over the life lifespan, and he, he values very much what he calls the tripartite brain. Okay, so that's going to be my bridge. So... This is your brain, okay? And this is what I'll say to folks, you know? So if you want your brain, this is your brain. And that there's three parts to your brain. There's your wrist, which represents your brain stem. And then your, your cortex is represented by your fingers. And that's what we usually think of when we think of the brain. But actually, the brain stem is what's kept alive when folks are, quote, brain dead but that that controls our eating, our swallowing, our temperature regulation. But then there's this third part of your brain represented by my thumb, which is the limbic system. And the limbic system actually is a very important network of neural connections and uh, nerve bodies that has the primary goal of, of survival. And that that has to do with two different parts. One is uh, increasing rewards and decreasing risks and then the other is mammalian and has to do with attachment because as ma mammals and some of those little animals that were in Mike's talk they have to relate and connect to their caregiver for the first year for us for mammals it's 10 years so there's an innate uh, system of attachment that's involved in the limbic system. And that's very important for all the ways that addiction uh, starts messing up your relationships, okay? And that the reason you need to know about the limbic system is that's where all the drugs of abuse work. They, they're not messing with your cortex. They're messing with your limbic system, okay? So, and then I draw a picture just to just uh, keep them engaged that way, and so then I just redraw the tripartite brain, you know, and I just say that's that's your that's your cortex, and then you have the brain stem, and then what sits on top of the brain stem <coughs> is the limbic system. You know, so really complex, you know, MRI here. <laughs> so, you know, and I, that's why I always have to get through my embarrassment when talking to folks with a lot of cortex. So, you know, the patients, they love this stuff, but, you know, I, I have to get through my own, uh, my own issues. Of, uh, so this is the limbic system and the brain stem. And in particular, obviously we talk about uh, the cortex, but then with you all, obviously we're talking about the prefrontal cortex, you know, this part in particular, which has a lot of influences on our choices and our behaviors. And that the limbic system obviously also takes in a lot of values from, you know, the environment, from the surrounds. And then, you know, I tend to try and draw, if I can, I'm a smiling person. Um, and so, again, just to emphasize the three different parts, but that we're going to primarily be talking about the limbic system. And so, the limbic system, again, the main function is survival. And that it has to do with increasing... Uh, uh, decreasing risks 
increasing rewards. And then that was some of what Mike was talking about, about the rewards, you know, have, you know, have to do with food, uh, sex, water, shelter. And that and then the risks are obviously all the dangers, you know, the predators. Okay. And that then the other big part is the attachment system. And that um, that is very much a part of the limbic system so that um, the fact that it in, is involved with addiction has a lot to do with all the different parts of which we can talk about as far as uh, your drug of choice replacing your relationships um, and reducing your ability to care for your children, your loved ones. But that, that that's a hijacking that goes on, okay? So I usually ask any questions so far? I mean, I mean it's pretty straightforward, right? So. And, and then the idea is, okay, so this is, this is the system you got. Um, the other thing that is, is key for the limbic system is that it has a GPS in it. So it has a system <coughs> of putting all these risk rewards uh, and predators within a context. So it makes a map of where the rewards are, where the risks are, and where the attachment figures are. And that it's, it's a map that is built within your brain that you go back to unconsciously. And that, but that it's, you can uh, appreciate the survival uh, capacity and the importance of having an ability to remember where the water is, where the food is, and so that we are constantly making maps and that this illness highlights that when it gets hijacked you know and some of the most confusing experiences that uh, folks have with addiction can be explained with this model you know because they often personalize it just one example would be you know I swore that I was wanting to stay sober you know, my conscious mind was I wanted to be sober. I was in a treatment program. I was 100% committed to being sober. I left the program and I found myself in my neighborhood of use. And I must have not really wanted to be sober. I guess I just didn't want to. And that this is just to say, no, actually what happened was your limbic system got the best of you. And that it took you back to a place that you were just naturally drawn to. Some uh, folks that I give this talk to will talk about experiences they've had that they don't like to talk about, about feeling like a tractor beam, where they, when they get stressed, they feel pulled to their neighborhood of use, where they just, and they describe experiences of not wanting to go there, but feeling compelled to go there and so that they're literally kind of consciously fighting the urge as they're driving or taking the bus to their neighborhood of use. Okay? So, and that this is, the GPS part of this is, is one way to explain that. You know, that this, it's just getting triggered again. Okay? So, um, so again, this is also where I have to deal. They, usually the patients are like full of stories and they want to talk all about it. So you all are being very good and just listening. So I just, any questions or comments, please let me know because I'm used to playing to a little bit more reactivity here. <laughs> <laughs> well, what kind of reactivity do you normally get in this moment? Oh, they're like, oh, do you mean this? Do you mean like that, you know, that's why like I stopped caring about my kids? Mm -hmm. You know, and like, oh, do you mean like that's like a reason that like, um, oh man, does, does this ever go away, Doc? Mm -hmm. You know, um, like you're, you're kind of telling a kind of a tough story. Um, you know, what, what, what does this mean for my future? You know, so kind of 
those kind of reactions. And how do you, on the one hand, hold hope and also yeah, right. address the reality of what you're showing? Okay, yeah. So I, this is one of my favorite lines. I said, well, do you want the good news or the bad news? I want the good news. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so the good news is, is you can change this, okay. you know. So, and the bad news is, is it never goes away. Hmm. That you, you know, because the survival system, you know, is, is such an innate part of our, our makeup, that once you learn these maps, they never go away. Hmm. So that they will always be potential hmm. triggers for hmm. you. Okay. And how do you talk about the interaction between the cortex, so the prefrontal cortex, and the limbic system? Okay, yeah. Thank you. That's a nice bridge. So what I tend to do is I use a metaphor. And so then I go into, I said, okay, so what do, how does this look? You know, because I said one of the things that is a real challenge is that we have a way over investment in our cortex and that we think we can outthink this illness. And, and in my experience, that has not been the case. Now, it's interesting, we were talking about the higher education folks and that maybe they're at less risk. Maybe. I mean, so, you know, I'm, I'm at the ski resort with a lot of injuries. So I may, I may be talking to the more, the more severe spectrum. But in my experience, you can't outthink this illness. And in most things, when, and I've had, I have some private patients with addiction that are high functioning and their cortex is not their friend in my experience. You know, they explain away a lot of behaviors with their cortex. Um, so I say a better metaphor for this is to think about your limbic system as your 800 pound gorilla. And the cortex is your trainer of your gorilla. And so it is extremely important to remember that is the scale. You know, some folks talk about elephants and you know, riding in on an elephant, but I think the cortex and the gorilla trainer tends to be the one that patients have responded to the best. And so your goal in this work you're gonna do, I'm talking to patients, is to get to know your gorilla. And it's, you're never gonna get rid of your gorilla. Um, and your gorilla is your friend. And, but you need to start to know your gorilla better. As far as, as a trainer, you know, what are the triggers for your gorilla's banana addiction, okay? And so you, you want to know um, first, you know, what are the environments that the bananas have been gotten in and what are the environments that have no connection to bananas? Um, that would be the first thing. But then also, um, as there's a whole nother series here about um, the neurohormonal effects on all this, but I just boil it down to you know the typical uh, AA halt language that you want to be very careful that your gorilla is not hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And so that, and you want to think that simply. Like, okay, are you, are you alone? Are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you tired? Those are the things that as a trainer with your cortex, you want to be focused on for reducing your risk of relapse. And all we're ever doing is reducing our risk of relapse. You never want to, in my experience, give patients some expectation that they will not use again. You, you want to depathologize those, those slips or whatever you want to call them, use episodes. So you use them in the sense of, you know, you want to minimize your risk of relapse. Miss, and, and so then we just kind of have fun with that analogy of the trainer and the gorilla. And so I'll say, you know, now would a trainer, how smart is a trainer if he's going to go into the cage with the gorilla and present him with bananas, you know, and tell him not to eat? You know, and so we laugh about that. And then we compare that to like folks who go into areas of their drug use and expect that they won't relapse, you know. And, and I usually, I tend, I say, if you remember anything from this lecture, remember this, that where you put your brain 
has more to do with your risk of relapse than anything else. So if you put your brain in the environment of bananas, you will relapse, most likely. If you put your brain where there's never been bananas, you have much less chance of relapse. Um, and, and so we, we just go with that. And then we start talking about the other side, which is, well, how do I fix this? You know, how do I, how do I get better from this? And this is where you start to say, well, you've got to start to, again, take back your brain. And you take it back in two ways. One is you start looking at what are the environments that you used in, what were the things that you thought you were getting rewards from, and how can you uh, substitute other activities. And so that's, you know, what other passions, what other pursuits can you do um, that are separate from the prior pursuits. And Again, using the 800-pound gorilla as the kind of metaphor, think at that level. Don't try and finesse it. Don't say, well, I'm going to go fishing, but be I always drank when I fished. But if I go and I use a different boat, or if I use it, you know, it's like, no. If you drank when you were fishing, don't ever fish again, you know. Or we'll, we'll give an exception to that in a second. Find other hobbies or activities that you did, that you enjoyed, that you can do sober. And so you get them thinking about that level of, sh of shifts. Um, and then obviously also, partly what gets lost in the risk and reward is they, there's a lot of stories they'll tell about, oh, is that why I risked all sorts of things and I didn't even think about it? You know, is that why I put myself at personal risk? And it's like, yeah, this is a way to understand that, that your brain was hijacked mm -hmm. and that you weren't able to even assess the reward versus the risk. It sort of flipped on it. You know, you begin to think r rewards are actually risks, but you, you, you start flipping it. Go ahead. What about, as we're talking about, like, sort of hobbies and pursuits, um, a lot of, I mean, one of the criteria is that sort of the activities that you used to enjoy may have gone by the wayside because yeah. your time was right. involved in sort of yes. pursuing your addiction. Is that is so we usually try and encourage, like go back to the things that you used to really enjoy, find your passion, your enthusiasm. Yes. But you know, that may be at odds with the recommendation of like don't do the things that you did while you used to use. So how do you balance those two things? I would just add the I would add the statement, what did you use when you were doing that activity? Mm -hmm. Because if your gorilla is associating that and bananas, don't go near it. At least, at least now, mm -hmm. don't go near it. But was it a was it a passion that you had before your addiction, and that your addiction took away from you? And if that's the passion, then pursue that. You know, because that would be gold. You know, some folks. You know, we do this talk, and they'll say, "Oh, you mean I should go back to fishing? Because I used to like fishing." Because fishing really bifurcates people. Either it was all, <laughs> it was all either alcohol infused or it wasn't. Okay, and so for some folks, it's like never go near a boat again, and then for other folks, it's like yeah, no, go back to fishing. You know, because that was never connected to to bananas. You know, so that's that's how I do that. Just but I ask that question mm -hmm. like, well, was it associated? And I just say. Because remember, we're talking about a gorilla here, okay? It's not going to figure that stuff subtly out, you know? You just And you really want to play carefully because you will go back to use if you, don't, if, you, if you don't train your gorilla correctly. But again, the idea here is you're, you're, you're training the gorilla in the best sense of the word of relating to it and wanting to kind of take care of it, you know? Because so many folks have a negative attacking view of their addiction and they want you to get rid of it like get rid of it doc I just want to be done with it I'm no longer an addict I don't find that's a useful long-term strategy you know for folks on our more severe end of the spectrum it's like how do you get to know your addiction how do you get to understand it understand what are the things that cause it what are the things that make it less likely to happen 
and and because there's so much hatred that gets into that you know and if you buy into that as a clinician it feels good initially because they want you to get rid of it, it but it doesn't work so it's so it's more how do you relate to that and then the other thing I say as far as the path to recovery is remember it's a relationship disorder so you want to focus on who you're hanging out with like how who are you putting yourself around? And that's one of the real benefits of AA and NA is you've got built-in sober communities that just are, you don't have to do anything. You sort of fall into them. But if you don't like that, then you have to work harder to build your community of sobriety. And so then, you know, but the, the focus is always on how can you build sober relationships? And of, of course, I'll just say again, what always comes up is sex, you know, and like, well, can, does that mean I can't have sex, you know, with anybody that I used with and or that is using? And I say, well, what do you think? Do you think the gorilla is smart enough to tell the difference? And they usually say no, and they already know it. But it, it does give you a metaphor that just, they just, and I just say, you know, you shouldn't, you should stay clear of that, you know, and and we, you know, I won't get it, but it gets kind of crude sometimes. But we do have conversations about that <clears throat> too, which I really think at some point you can, if you're going to stay in this field, you got to get comfortable with that kind of level of discussion, mm -hmm. because patients are very kind to us. They understand what makes us uncomfortable, and they won't talk about it. But often that's the stuff they need to talk about. You know, which is, well, what does this mean I should have sex with, with this partner or not? Um, and because it's, it's limbic. And so the, I also find this model kind of can help us bridge it in a way that doesn't feel as um, foreboding for us coming in from our training uh, to talk about sex. Um, it's not something I'd say I start right away with, but you, you definitely want to have it in there in the conversation. Um, they're they're thinking about it all the time. Um, so, um, and so then I just but I then I say and this is where you can start to reconnect to your relationships and that this is also where I try and do a little normalizing of the destruction of their relationships that have happened through their addiction career and how how bad they feel about either their childcare duties that they've let go or their relationship uh, that have d deteriorated. And so I start to just give them some hope that this is a way they can kind of start to reconnect slowly, but to try and, again, work to reconnect with sober people, your original attachment figures that your brain got hijacked away from. Um, and that that is also part of that recovery, what you recover is you know those connections go ahead you're the model that you sort of like and yeah. i've heard a similar one from dan siegel oh yeah so, yeah obviously he talks yeah, yeah. about the interpersonal neurobiology of emotion regulation yep and he talks about this little spot where your fingernails touch your thumb yeah. is, is yeah. your prefrontal cortex yeah connection yeah and that when you get emotionally hijacked he says you know you flip your lid yeah yeah, and yeah. That you know, it takes time before those kind of reconnect, and I think a lot of people use substances almost sort of like a weighted blanket to you know to be able to to regulate that out of yeah. control limbic system. Yeah. And I think about things like DBT being really helpful because for a lot of our a lot of our patients have been using longitudinally, their emotion regulation skills kind of stalled out at about fourteen, mm -hmm. and so you know they might be forty four and they don't have adult coping skills for regulating their own emotional states other than their substance and we've just taken that away from them or yeah. they've taken away from themselves yeah and then when they get when they flip their lid they don't know what to do other than to kind of lay it back down with whatever their substance you bet yeah. yep yeah well said yeah yeah i agree and go ahead just another question about the the hate feeling you were mentioning yeah. before. Yeah. Uh, thinking about relationships as you did with other people, but what about relationships to the self? And just yes. hearing those moments of deep shame and deep self blame. And, yeah. And how yeah. do you navigate? Like, what's the verbiage you use? Yeah. Um, 
and the three of us are the addiction medicine primary care fellows, yeah. so we're primary care doctors doing yes. addiction yes. And, okay. and thinking about what are, you know, in a primary care yeah. visit or like yeah. in our, what's our yeah. like short, what, yeah, what things short can we version. access? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, in a short visit, yeah. I think, it's a, it's a, I, think it, I think I think it is a tone, it is a tone. I mean, it is a tone that you're setting, you know, and where you, you, you don't, don't try and talk them out of their hate, you know, for themselves. But, because um, I think we, I don't think it helps them if we come in with too big a difference as far as, um, you know, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. Yeah, or, that you know, problem? oh, it's a brain illness. You know, especially if it's just coming out of like a quick visit, you know. You should hold on to that, mm -hmm. and, and you should remember that. But I think for 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 them, it's often like um, just receiving that hatred mm -hmm. and just kind of absorbing it and just sitting with it and just sort of feeling the pain of it with them. Mm -hmm. Like, this is a really horrible illness, mm -hmm. you know. That's the first step I do, mm -hmm. you know. Just this is a horrible illness, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, depending on how much nonverbal connection you feel with them, you know, maybe introducing a, a slight different way to look at it, mm -hmm. but maybe not, mm -hmm. you know, just but just te just normalizing this. I mean, I the longer I work with addiction, as much as the the spontaneous recoveries and stuff, and, and it may be because we're here at this end of the spectrum. I hate this illness. Mm -hmm. I mean, this illness destroys people it destroys relationships mm -hmm. in a way cancer doesn't you know I don't know about head and neck cancer but I other than head and neck cancer I, I might choose cancer over addiction if I had to choose um, it's really bad so just trying to be with that level of, mm -hmm. of uh, and then the, sh the the shame is the tough part because that's where they they've taken it personally and it, you can see the limbic system is all about connections, relationships with others and with yourself. So your brain is hijacked and you do do horrible things mm -hmm. and you will think it's you because it's, mm -hmm. it, it's, and that's the spiritual kind of cure. You know, I think the limbic system has a lot to do with your connection with the greater, greater, greater thing. So. Mm -hmm. That's where it's not surprising to me that uh, those sort of treatments can be effective because it gives you a sense of connection to a greater purpose, a greater entity. Um, but it's it's kind of trying to reclaim that uh, the natural sort of limbic system versus what's been hijacked. Um, yeah. Question. So when you're talking about you know reclaiming your brain, or, or yeah. the good news is you can't yeah. change it. Yeah. But you know I'm wondering how you, if you ever talk about time course with that with patients, how long it takes. Yeah. Because there's yeah. as you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of yeah. push to be like I want this behind yes. me. Yes. Right. I want the not yeah. anymore. Yeah. I'm gonna take this suboxone. Yeah. This is dealt with. And then, and then it's I'm done, okay. and now I'm fine. Oh, yeah. Right. I only want to stay on suboxone for a month. Yeah. You know, yeah. Then, right. So how do you talk yeah. through those have those discussions? Um, I, I just, I, I, uh, I love those conversations, especially in this lecture, you know, and I'll say, okay, okay, everybody. I said, so how long did this take to get this way? And, you know, the, you know, all of them there have been 20 to 40 years, you know, I said, okay, so how quick do you think you're going to get over it? You know, and I, so I don't tell them, I just say, how quick do you, you know, now i <laughs> you know, and, and then that's all. I just say, yeah. I say, you know, I say, it, it, you know, the journey of a lifetime begins with a step, so take a step. But I said, I mean, and that's this, I, I just like playing good news, bad news, and I encourage you to use that model if you can, because there's a lot of good news, bad news that you have to carry simultaneously with this illness. Mm -hmm. And so I just say, the good news is, is you can make some changes. But, you know, this isn't going to be you know quick you know we don't and I you know and I'll put out I said and they say well and often they'll say well can't you just figure out where to cut <laughs> and and just cut it out and I'll say I'll say well you know look at look at what what system is getting hijacked I said do you want to stop enjoying life 
you want to stop and join relationships? I said, that'll, I said, lobotomies work. I said, I don't think, I don't think you want that. So I said, unfortunately, you have to, do, you know, and I'll play different metaphors. Sorry, I'll mix metaphors here. But, you know, you have to be your own little brain surgeon. And I said, you have to start making. So I'll do occasional, like, neural lectures about the, you know, synaptic feet and, you know, building the different, you know, neuronal pathways and sort of Eric Kandel stuff. But that I tended to shift away from that to just more this simple lecture. Um, but that you basically have to do the microsurgery to start shifting. But I say, but remember, keep it simple. Re environment. You know, if you're in a barber shop long enough, you get a haircut. So don't go to barber shops. You know, and anyone. You know, and sometimes they'll challenge me with that, and I'll say, well, I, I, I was, I've been at a bar drinking water. You know, for the last. I said, okay, great. I said, you walked through a minefield ten times, and you made it. I said, good luck, do it again. You know, so I can be a little, I can be a little, I can be a little, and, and that's the other thing I'd say is, don't be afraid to put a little emotion into what you say with your patients, you know, because this is an emotional illness. Mm -hmm. And don't talk them out of it with your language. You gotta relate to them. And sometimes a little confrontation in the best sense of the word a little challenge, a little humor, a little, you know, gets, I think, gets more impact than, than uh, talking to them about uh, data and stuff. I mean, data is important for us to know what's helpful, what's not, but for, for patients, it's, you know, and, and that's, that's just something, I, and I'm not saying that you're going to do that immediately, but I'd really encourage you to work towards that and bringing yourself into it. Um, and we've all, I mean, I'll just say, I mean, I didn't get into this business because I wasn't connected with addiction, okay? So we all have personal addiction relationships in our past that you are what I would encourage the sooner the better to start to get to understand your own experience with addiction. Because that, you, I don't say that to my patients, but you, you, they pick that up, you know, as far as whether you are being honest with yourself about this illness and then they'll they'll open up you know because there are there you can imagine this illness is so stigmatized that they're waiting to be judged and they're waiting for you to sort of look away or look down or or, or have some judgment on them so the more we can kind of relate and it's kind of back to the, I love those slides you had a puppy dog and you know it's really getting back to that level of relationship you know it's and you know that I often I'll sometimes I'll say the limbic system we share with dogs and cats, and that's why we feel so much in that level of connection with them, and so that's you kind of want to get to that level with your patients, mm -hmm. you know, um, and you know you don't you don't have to say anything to your dog, and you know you have incredible connection, so, so talk less. Other other comments or questions? You know, your, your point about, and this kind of goes to your question about what you do if you have that. Sure. That might be the first time they've had a conversation about their substance use, and they're probably not going to remember what you say, but they will most decidedly remember what you, how you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And if you amplify that shame signal, which is already like so loud as it is, that's all they'll remember. Mm -hmm. So that might be the first time they ever have the experience of talking about their substance use in a way that they didn't leave feeling ashamed. And that's super powerful. Because I think what you're saying is spot on, that really this is a, you know, it's a learning disorder, but it's also really a limbic, it's an emotional disorder. So if that's all they leave with is a feeling that I told somebody and they didn't humiliate me, wow, I mean, that's potent. You know, then they can sort out like what the actually steps are next. But if you have that conversation, then there's a gate that's left open. That's a shift into the attachment system. Mm -hmm. So that's like being able to provide an attachment experience with the patient is actually going to compete with some of the other kinds of things that they're oriented to. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really yeah. be viable as a treatment relationship mm -hmm. step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and you know, and again, that also is you know a model that I encourage them. I say, so if you're in AA, that's partly what you're doing. You're retaking back your brain. So I try and emphasize, like that's great if you like AA, because not only you get two things. One is you get, you know, they're, they're, well, there 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 are many things from AA, but one is a lot about relationships and about getting a sponsor. You know, have a person that you share your most serious, you know. Uh, step four, step five stuff, you know, where it's all about the horrible behaviors you've done through this addiction, but you're doing it within a context of a relationship with somebody that most likely, hopefully, will not shame you uh, for it. Uh, but it also is just you're, you're building environments of sobriety, you know, which is, it's just that simple, you know. Sometimes they want it to be a little more complicated. You know, I find that some of the folks I work with uh, who, you know, are in the more um, more educated end, you know, they want to understand it cognitively. They want to they understand that they can outthink this illness and they can do everything, you know. And I, that's, I find that much more challenging than just keep it simple, you know, and just do the simple stuff. about other, any other... What, just to be interested, just feedback, right? And this is what I'll do with the, what, what, what's helpful about this model? What don't you understand or don't find as useful? I mean, I just am always interested in just uh, uh, feedback from that level. What, you, what are you getting from the talk? What, what are you not getting from the talk? Yeah. So, so one thing that I thought of while you were doing yeah. the talk was, I work in a hospital primarily, and so um, I find that with patients, what you're saying is very helpful. Mm -hmm. We often, because it's in the hospital, have the families much closer than they would be in an outpatient or in a psychiatric yeah. setting. And I, it's always very helpful for the patient when we, you know, I, don't, I, didn't really, I didn't have the gorilla one, so that's really helpful. To okay, use. good, take um, that one. <laughs> but what I find often helps the families, and which they almost never get, for years and years because of the amount of confidentiality so it's an opportunity for us is for them because they have no sense they have a sense of the problem and how it's inflicted on them but they don't have much of a sense of what how they can think of it and what I usually tell them is imagine that each your day begins when you wake up and you have to decide what you're going to eat imagine their day begins after they've been starving till, till dinner and then everyone says, just relate the food in the same way that you would. And I find that a lot of families um, can relate to that much more because you know they're they're sick of the limbic system of their spouse, or their yes. and they're yeah. and they're tired of its importance in their yeah. lives, etc. Right. So I think I found that a way for them to understand what what it really means, and yeah. that's not going to change. And yeah. Well, and they they felt the 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 impact of the limbic yeah, dis yeah. hijacking and they this isn't this isn't a concept this is a felt experience and they're furious yeah. and they're also incredibly sad mm. you know because they lose you lose your your loved one through this process um, in, in, a, in a really uh, cunning baffling and powerful way as AA says mm. um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's not, I find I have to be really, um, really centered when I talk to the families because they are so mad and, and so desperate and so anxious and, and you're getting the whole kind of, so that, yeah, you really, it's much more challenging than working one-on-one -on -one with a patient. Um, and so it's this weird mix of normalizing what they're going through but then also trying to kind of give some sense of understanding to the addictive process. But I, I try and err very, very, very much towards understanding their pain and their anger and their anxiety and their fears the, the more than explaining addiction. Um, you know, that's, mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's an unrelated question with, with patients who have Kind of burned all the bridges of family. Yes. And they've gotten into recovery, yes. and they're interested, and they're, yes. they're yes. reconnecting and reaching out. And yes. 
they may not be getting a lot of people who are very interested. Yes, right, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. They're not getting a lot of... talk through that with your patients and this recovery model. And the, yeah, and the kind of yeah, yeah. yeah that. I, that's something that's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know. I tend to make a joke about it just because it's so painful otherwise. But, I, you know, I say, well, you know, go, go look where the light is. You know, like, who wants connection with you who's sober? Don't, don't say who do you want? Who, want. who looks like they want connection with you? Start there. You know, and don't start with the, the, the folks you want connection with that have given you all sorts of signals not to connect. You know, I say it's just rebuilding. You're rebuilding your attachment system. I said, so start with where somebody's interested in connecting with you and go there, you know, and it, it may be just your neighbor, you know, and maybe just start there, you know, but don't, you know, your daughter who you have, you know, used their credit card or you've done, all, you know, don't, don't start there. Because, you know, what often will happen is they'll go there and they'll have a horrible experience. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the rage, all that shame and everything just comes out. And then they just, they just you know, they just take that all. And so it's just, it just tends to worsen the situation. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, it, I, you know, and I try, I, I do a lot of humor. Because it's a pretty dark illness, okay? I mean, sorry to tell you if you didn't know it already, but it's a, <laughs> this is a pretty dark illness. I mean, I, 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 I started off saying I'd never work with addiction, and then I ended up with addiction work, and I was like, and I really was amazed at, like, this recovery thing, because in mental health, I was, I was on the inpatient service, and nobody got that much better, mm -hmm. you know. But here, you know, some of these spontaneous remitters or folks who are doing the work, they become these wonderful new people. And I thought, oh, this is an awesome illness to work with. <sighs> so anyway, now, <laughs> <laughs> now I don't know, it's tempered. It's like, it's like, it's really rough, you know, and it's, 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 it's a tough, tough illness to uh, the, the brain, the survival mechanism. And, and this helps me sort of hold on to the fact that this is such a challenging disorder to, to recover from. So but anyway. Any, any other comments? Or? Thank you. Was that yeah, was it helpful? Useful? Yes. Was it very okay? All right. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. And scene. All right. <laughs>